Every now and then, on Twitter, I like to ask the audience what game they'd like me to review next. I don't do it too often, but I find it sometimes pushes me to look at a game I otherwise would have passed over or got into at a much later date. So, Ali Shannon requested Vampire for the Commodore 64. I didn't recognise the title, so I went and did a little digging. The first thing I found was the cassette cover, and I do believe we've accidentally found the most homoerotic image ever created by man, beast, or machine. I also think Dracula may have soiled himself a little. Still, this cover art didn't give that much away, so I did a bit more digging and I found that Vampire is a sequel to Phantomus. Or rather, it's Phantomus 2, but with a different name. This is a fairly obvious Spectrum port from the loading screens to the graphics, and it initially put me at ease. I played Phantomus a lot as a kid. I had no idea what I was doing, but that goes for pretty much any Spectrum game. However, I seem to remember finding it a lot more enjoyable than Jet Set Willy at a young age. Which is probably going to be absolute sacrilege around these parts, but still. The two games were rather similar, apart from one minor detail. An energy bar. Phantomus 2, or Vampire, continues this trend. The good thing about having energy is that it gives you leeway while you're exploring, and ultimately, Vampire is most definitely about exploration. You're tasked with scouring Dracula's castle for five keys and placing them in five corresponding locks. But the rest of the instructions I found were relatively unclear, and I'm going to assume that the person who wrote these isn't a native English speaker, but they were so charmingly, adorably absurd that I refused to go and look at any other instructions. These are genuine instructions I found on the mobygames.com website. I'll leave a link in the description because it is quite possibly the loveliest description of any game I've ever seen. The instructions go as follows. The mission in Vampire is rather obscure. The player must destroy the evil Count Dracula who is devastating the region. The nightmare scenario will be the castle of this malevolent personage. Throughout 95 horrifying rooms, the player will be besieged by Dracula's slaves. Try to avoid them and obtain the greater amount of food as possible. If the player reunites the five keys and introduce them in its five corresponding bolts, the player will have done a very important part of the mission. In order to obtain each key, the player must find a certain object and fix it in the generator by pedals. If the player does it, the player will be able to jump the enormous pit. This all sounds suitably exciting, but wait, it gets better. The second part of the mission consists in opening the six magical counter windows, pressing the suitable switches. Uh, finally, search for the hammer and the stake and walk quickly to the superior part of the castle to take the cross. At this moment, the player will be teleported to the space to get rid of the final confrontation in which the player will be able to use the laser weapon and the self-propelled knapsack. Now, I've not completed the game, but I don't feel like self-propelled knapsack is the correct terminology. Regardless, this entire description made me want to play it much more than this did. Codemasters should have just used self-propelled knapsack as a box quote, to be honest. It would have been a bestseller. Anyway, I needn't have bothered reading the instructions in all honesty, because I couldn't really get far enough to use any of the wonderful information I'd garnered from it. This game is the sort of difficult that has you blaming the game 90% of the time, and the other 10% of the time, you're still so angry that you'll just blame the game anyway. Vampire may well give you an energy bar instead of a one-hit death system, but it uses this opportunity to pepper you with untold damage, sometimes as soon as the game starts. Look at this! Look at it! I have literally just been born into this world and I've already lost a portion of health to a green skull. You start inside an enemy, why? I should have taken this as a sign to come because avoiding enemies often feels like a complete impossibility throughout this entire game. The third room in the game, for instance, has a barrel that moves back and forth. There are two arrow traps that will fire at you when they detect a presence directly in front of them. There's a narrow passage where you need to get through. And there's a floor trap. Now, how on earth am I supposed to pass all of this, to time any of it? There is no learning curve here. The game throws everything at you because it believes it has leeway to do so. We gave you an energy bar, what more do you want? A fight in chance? Don't be stupid. There are ways to alleviate the constant barrage of energy sapping negative Nancys, if you can make it past the first lot that is. You'll find delicious chunks of meat dotted around the castle. 
Grabbing one of these fills up an entire health bar for you, and you can stock health bars up, which sort of gives you an extra life in a way. It's kind of nice. But then, things like this happen. Look, I fell down a pit and there's a tank there. There's no way back up. Well, that's me dead then. Oh, look down there, there's an object to pick up, because literally every other interactable item I've found thus far flashes, therefore teaching me that flashing things are indeed good and I should pick them up. Oh no, I've jumped down and it's hurting me, I better jump out. Oh, I can't. These death traps can be heartbreaking when you finally pushed further ahead, but at least they can easily be avoided once you know about them. The further you get into this castle, the harder it gets, and the more you realise just how frustrating movement in this game can be. There are two jump buttons. One is a short jump and one is a big jump. I actually quite like this idea, and getting used to the distances each one provides is relatively simple. But then we get to a room like this, and we see how frustrating jumping can become. Firstly, there's a moving platform we've got to get to. Short jump won't do it, and long jump is slightly too high, so you have to get into the correct position. Wait for the platform to be in place, and then jump in order to land on it. But the game won't allow you to get into position without a kick up the backside, because there's a laser beam going on and off at the bottom part of the level, so you constantly have to jump if you don't want to take damage. And you can't jump straight up, you can only jump left or right, and if you hit anything while you jump, your trajectory is messed up, so you're never sure where you're going to land because you keep hitting the roof or the moving platform. And the moving platform is moving so far to the left and right that if you do land on it, and you don't get yourself into position to jump toward the key straight away, the roof pushes you off the platform and you have to do it all over again. But moving from left to right isn't super responsive, so you either don't get into position in time or you just keep jumping the wrong way, and all the while, all the while, all the while, I'm taking damage after damage after damage, and... Oh, calm down. Look, difficulty can be a very polarizing subject in games. I personally love difficult games, I grew up throwing all of my pocket money away on arcade machines. But I also knew which machines were worth my time, and which ones were out to steal my credits. Vampire uses its energy bar like a torture device. In a game like Jet Set Willy or Manic Miner, the game will punish you for a single mistake. This kind of game can be absolutely abhorrent to some, but it makes you learn its rhythm. It becomes doable, for the most part, with practice. Is it enjoyable to everyone? No. For as much love as the series gets, their difficulty is still a polarizing subject matter. But there's no denying that the games are precise. Practice and precision go hand in hand. With Vampire, the opposite is true. The game doesn't punish you for taking a hit, but it uses that as leverage to paint its world with a slapdash approach to difficulty. The game is built around damage being an inevitability, and that approach to game design doesn't have the same feeling of tight consistency. On completion of a level in Manic Miner, you're likely to say, yes, I've finally done it. On completion of a room in Vampire, you're likely to say, Oh, thank god I got through that, but now I don't even know if I've got enough health to make it through the next room. To add insult to injury for Commodore owners, they didn't even make decent use of the host hardware. Sound effects may have been boosted, and there's a nice enough title screen tune, but the graphics have been lifted wholesale outside of the main character. I can't completely write the game off though, even if I have spat on its undead corpse for the last however many minutes. If you can forgive the wild difficulty of the game and you can get used to the often awkward jumping mechanics when dealing with tight spaces, then Vampire likely does hold a good chance of keeping you happy if you're looking for a standard 80s exploration platformer. I will warn you though, I've watched footage of the game from later areas and I can tell you this, you're in for a rough ride if you want to add this to your completion list. I do not want to add this to my completion list.